Good morning. Thank you, Professor McAllister, Professor McDonald, and Professor Kalanick. We'd also like to extend a thanks to our guest judges and anyone else joining us along with the class. We are China A, and today we will, we will be explaining why China does not pose a threat to the U.S. interests. Furthermore, it will be explained how the U.S. can and should continue to seek peaceful ways to integrate China into the global world order, while continuing to integrate ourselves into Asian institutions. To my left, we have Molly Badertha, our economic expert, Caroline Beckman, our military expert, and Brittany Chung, our regional relations expert. I am Michaela Ray, and I have the privilege of serving as the leader to this group of hardworking and diligent young ladies. We will begin the presentation by giving some background on the current state of Chinese American affairs. The Sino-American debate is largely centered around whether or not China's rapid rise, both in regards to military and economic capacities, is a threat to the existing world order, and more specifically, to the U.S. and its interests. Those who see the rise of China as a threat point to its increase in military spending and the actions it has taken in regards to Taiwan and the South China Sea. These actions are often and mistakenly taken as a sign that China is preparing itself for a regional takeover and making way for a revisionist world order. However, as we will explain in our presentation, these claims are often exaggerated, aimed at fueling the security tension between the U.S. instead of working to mitigate it. We take the position that the U.S. has little to fear from rapid Chinese economic and military growth, and contrary to what critics might suggest, China will not pose a threat to the U.S.'s position as a leading global power. That being said, the U.S. should work together with China as a growing power to work towards ending the tension between the two countries in the international arena. The U.S. should do its best to bring China under its umbrella of influence, as provoking the country, whether that be through containment or the presence of military troops, will only prove costly on behalf of our country. There are effective ways in which the U.S. and China can cooperate on economic issues and avoid tensions over trade or finances. There are multiple ways the U.S. can do this, such as making existing international institutions more accommodating to social advancement and economic growth. And this is essential. Both the U.S. and China are at turning points. China is fast approaching the status of a great power with its rapid accumulation of wealth, bless you, um, and military technology, and the U.S. is facing an international arena with growing powers that have the chance to come close to matching its own. These countries can benefit immensely by ensuring that the other is secure and has the ability to prosper. It is imperative for the U.S. and China to work together as the current state of global affairs demands cooperation between two of the world's growing powers, great powers. Now you may be thinking that this approach is a nice idea, but China simply won't cooperate. Today we will explain not only will they want to, but that they will have to in order to maintain their interests. China's economy is based on a global free trade market, a market that has and is still supported by existing international institutions, many of which were pioneered by the U.S. It will later be explained how making adjustments to these institutions will only increase the incentive for China to work within their frameworks. Second, as China acquires more wealth and power, they will want a stable global environment to protect their newly acquired assets. Creating a revisionist international order will almost certainly create an unstable environment, making various nations, including China, vulnerable, something no sovereign nation wants. The ultimate framework we will suggest will be one based on interdependence. Key steps to this strategy involve facilitating the peaceful integration of China into multilateral institutions, cooperating with China to minimize strategic competition, and working with China to protect our global commons and institutions with agreed upon rules on diplomacy and trade. The key policy points are as follows. During our section on economics, Mali, our economic expert, will explain how peacefully integrating China into already established multilateral institutions <coughs> will prove not only beneficial for the U.S. and China, but essential to our interests. She will also explain the ways in which the U.S. can further integrate and lend influence into the Asian economy and politics. Next, we will address the importance of minimizing strategic competition. Caroline, our military expert, will explain how the best way to mitigate the security dilemma that is developed between the U.S. and China will be through increased transparency and cooperation techniques from both sides. Instead of attempting to contain China's military growth, the U.S. should work with it, or rather engage it. The last point will be focused on integrating China and the U.S. into the regional order. Brittany, our regional relations expert, will explain how the U.S. can benefit from working with institutions such as ASEAN, ASEAN, to help diminish the perception of the U.S. as an imperialistic hegemon and replace it with one that presents the U.S. as a partner of diplomacy and cooperation. Before I hand it off to Molly, I want to leave you with the final message going forward. When we discuss Sino-American relations and the rise of China, 
We should not make the mistake in thinking that this relationship is solely between two regional hegemons. Instead, we should see the US and China as two partners, each with enormous wealth and power, leading the global community in the present and in the future. Thank you, Michaela. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Molly, and today I will be discussing the future of the Sino-American Economic Partnership, both the perceived attendant risks and the opportunities presented by it. Yet, before we address policy, it is important to concretely dispel the wide misconception that China's rise poses a threat to U.S. interests. First and foremost, there are gains enjoyed across the board by this relationship. We are Ch China's top trading partner, and they are our second. I will address three reasons why the Chinese economic growth deceivingly appears more robust and forceful than it is, in absolute terms and relative to the United States and other powers. Reasons why China will, in future years, be critically reliant on reforming and liberalizing its economy and investing more in being a responsible stakeholder in multilateral financial institutions. Historically, these intractable elements of Chinese society and the Chinese economy um, have acted as catalysts for the, rapid for the rapid economic growth of the past two decades. However, today, the same intractable elements are causing and will cause, at best, the tapering of Chinese economic growth, and at worst, outright economic contraction if they are not remedied and if inform reforms are not enacted. First, China's large population power powered the massive growth of the past two decades. Yet due to the one-child policy, um, which exponentially cut the Chinese population born after 1980, China will confront the challenge of an aging population, which, um, which um, will have t a total of 300 million pensioners by the year 2040. Um, today, the ratio of workers per retiree is eight to one. By then, it will have plummeted to two to one. Second, China's credit binge spent to power it through the 2008 global financial crisis stands at 250% of its GDP. That's up 100 percentage points from 2008. China's reliance on credit-driven investment will prove burdensome in the future, especially as the real estate sector deals with feeble domestic consumption and a massive inventory of unsold homes. Third and last, even though the total GDPs of the, of the US and China are now more or less equal, Absolute economic size does not translate into absolute power. Countries with larger economies do not necessarily have more resources at their disposal. China has a per capita GDP of 7,000 US dollars, while um, that of the US stands at 55,000 US dollars according to the World Bank. Um, and that gap has expanded since 1991. Um, 1.3 billion people can produce a massive output but it will almost be immediately consumed, especially with 200 million Chinese people living below the World Bank's poverty line. What matters for national power is not absolute economic size, but surplus wealth that a nation can actually use. Realistically, the law of large numbers applies to, to nations as well as economies. The larger an economy gets, simply the harder it is to grow. Unsurprisingly, China's growth rate for 2015 has already slowed to 7%. Even President Xi Jinping characterized single-digit growth, the lowest of two decades, as the new normal. Many even regard the $4 trillion stock market crash in early June as yet another sign that China is deviating from its pattern of previous growth. Um, as the U.S. recovers from a financial crisis and reassumes economic stability, China's economy is at a turning point as well. With tapering growth and fiscal issues of its own, China will seek in the 21st century to reform and liberalize its operational architecture and integrate itself as much as possible into the global economy in which it already has so much at stake. Furthermore, the notion that China would seek to undermine U.S. interests if it had the resources to do so um, discounts the fact that China can't disentangle its interests from the U.S. and the global economy. Um, this is because China holds foreign exchange reserves, four trillion of them. China is, in this way, entrapped, all assuredly motivated to protect U.S. economic stability and promote growth. Given the involvements in state of China's economy, we can be assured that China is incentivized to integrate itself into global financial frameworks and ensure that its rise is mutually beneficial to others. And U.S. power consists not only in preponderant power, but in the structural power within the very institutions into which China will seek integration. Within these frameworks, the U.S. has the power to formulate agendas. 
um, prescribe normative guidelines within which states relate to one another, and set the ambit of choices available to other states. Together, we two nations have incredible economic potential. Yet if the US fails to cooperate with and instead tries to alienate or exclude China, the cost would also be tremendous. We saw and are currently experiencing this enormous opportunity cost after the formation of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, which kicked off earlier this year. The AIIB, um, which um, will operate similarly to the US and Japan-led World Bank and Asian Development Bank, was founded over the Chinese concern that the governance structure of those existing institutions was evolving way too slowly, that they were detrimentally risk averse, and that there should be increased focus and funds directed toward infrastructure. Basically, China has deep pockets, and the US-led institutions have not met the growing demands for roads, railroads, and pipelines in Asia. US diplomatic response to the rise of the AIB has not been adroit, for there is an unnecessary fear that China will use the bank to circumvent US-led institutions and to further Beijing's political ends. Still, there is absolutely no reason for alarm. Over 60 countries have joined already, even countries for whom relations with China are chilly, such as Taiwan, Norway, and India, and even staunch US allies we tried to dissuade from joining, such as Australia. It would be difficult for China in such a broad-based organization to exert an exclusive or unilateral agenda. A refusal to join for the US government would run the risk of creating competing blocks and institutions and of self-alienation in an increasingly bipolar landscape. This is why we should join the AIIB as soon as possible, exert influence from within rather than from outside the system, and maybe even attempt to place an American on the international board of directors, rather than stubbornly suffering losses. Instead of trying to alter the Asian order, we should try to maximize our role within the new emerging one. In line with this policy of inclusivity in international financial institutions, Washington should extend the, um, in it, an invitation to China on the proposed trade agreement, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. We have not yet, and if we don't in the second expansion, then not only will the US lose a great deal of business with China, which according to a Brookings Institute estimate, stands at a potential of $14 billion, um, but also the strength, credibility, and attractiveness of the deal as a whole to the entire Asian region will be weakened. What's really neat is that if China is brought into this deal, then the TPP could operate like the definitive set of rules guiding the flow of economic activity in the region. Meanwhile, the AIIB, with its investments in growth and infrastructure, can increase the actual economic capacities and capabilities of the region. In that sense, one, the AIIB, would operate as the hardware of economic development, while the other, the TPP, would be the software of economic integration meaning the US would still maintain a huge degree of control over and involvement in all economic activity and trade. Lastly, we should try to urge China to be coherent as per its sought after global identity as a responsible stakeholder in the economic community and global marketplace. And the outlook is positive for China, a nation that has already proven it takes its role seriously in organizations such as the World Trade Organization, especially given its relative stage of development. When it joined in 2001, after 15 years of arduous negotiations, it had to make many pricey concessions, such as amending and appealing over 3,000 pieces of law, um, increasing online governmental transparency, training national, provincial, and local officials on trade violations and WTO-related issues, and pledging to help many of the WTO's least developed countries. It is very clear that China can and wants to be a respected, proactive, and responsible actor in the coming years. In conclusion, if we follow these initial policy recommendations of integration, we can capitalize on the incredible economic potential that lies within this partnership. If, however, we fail to do so, we not only suffer an opportunity cost, but also can needlessly risk alienation, um, both of which are counter to US interests. Indeed, in today's interwoven global economy, enthusiastic cooperation with China is an imperative um, for the US as well as for China one that China will fulfill heartily and one that we can fulfill through actively facilitating China's inter integration into existing and emerging international financial frameworks and increasing both China's role and responsibility within those frameworks. Thank you very much. And now I will pass it over to Caroline Beckman, our military affairs expert. Thank you, Molly. I'm Caroline and I'll be speaking on the military perspective. As I believe all of you must know, China continues to expand and modernize its military capacity, a fact that sparks concern for many Americans as well as other nations around the world. 
Recently, China has released white papers, revealing several new and important military decisions. One, China's military budget has increased by 10% in 2015. Second, the Air Force will now be both a defensive and an offensive force. Third, the People's Liberation Army, or PLA, will be allowed to project power farther beyond borders and sea in order to safeguard maritime possessions. I am here to tell you why China's recent military actions do not pose a threat to the United States or to our allies abroad. To start, the United States is, and most likely will always be, the top military competitor on the world stage, at least in the foreseeable future. China could not harm the United States. The repercussions would be way too massive for them to handle. Second, China relies heavily on the current world order to maintain the growth of its rising power. China would not act drastically militarily due to their reliance on a stable world. Based on their increase in power and wealth, China shares the same aspirations as the United States to relieve tensions in order to protect the peace. Their protection of world order and unwillingness to strike out militarily in turn benefits themselves while also benefiting the United States. For the United States, there are two major concerns involved in China's military expansion, the increase in budget and China's actions towards extending their reach. Although these are areas of concern, I am going to share with you why they will not harm the United States or US interests. The increase in Chinese military budget is not a threat for several reasons. To start, although China does have the second largest defense budget in the world, it, is not, it does not even scratch the surface of the budget of the United States. The U.S. has more than the next eight countries combined in military budget, allowing the United States access to whatever it needs, whenever it needs it, for military ventures. Also, regardless of the increase in budget, there is no certainty that investments in new technology will actually work. It is also not certain what portions of their budget actually go where. We have heard, however, that a large sum has been used for military salary increase, as well as another large sum dedicated to the investigation of corrupt military officers. New technology to compete with the United States is not their only or nor even their top goal. China's true military goals are unknown, which does cause tension within the Asian Pacific region, specifically with recent reports of China's military extending its reach um, simply beyond securing its borders. Specifically, China has begun extending military throughout the South China Sea, which has sparked questions among several U.S. allies located in the area. The Chinese apparently do not want the United States meddling in the situation, but they do want to avoid crises, and in order to do this, they would like to strengthen their relationship with the United States. The recent white papers China released caused for the continued exchanges with the United States military to strengthen mutual trust, prevent risks, and manage crises. So, although China would like to handle the South China Sea on their own, they are willing to strengthen their military relationship with the United States in order to avoid large-scale military problems. Although China's actions plan actual plans are unclear, China is not attempting to spread anti-democracy or communism throughout the region. Their goal remains to enrich its power and, in, and extend it, sorry, enrich its people and extend its power. To our allies, China's extended reach may seem threatening, which makes sense. However, if investigated further, China's military expansion poses no threat to the safety of our allies in our region. To start, as I mentioned before, regardless of military increase, China remains beneath the United States in military power ranking. The United States is committed to our alliances with these nations, and therefore, they are not in any immediate danger. If China did attack Taiwan, for example, or Japan, they would have to answer not only to both modern and technologically advanced resistances, but also the United States Army, Air Force, and our Navy as well. Once the lack of threat is understood, the extension of China's military reach can be seen as a promising aspect to hopefully po a positive relationship between our two nations. Although there are threats that come with the expansion of Chinese military budget and the extension of their reach for power, the military increase in China is also promising to the United States and surrounding nations. For example, China's increase in budget allows China to invest in technology that could aid in global peacekeeping, including anti-piracy. On the other hand, China's military reach extension would give China closer access to areas in desperate need of aid, for example, post-natural disasters, as they did with Nepal. China is closer and more equipped to give aid to countries in the surrounding the Asian Pacific region. 
In order to protect ourselves from China's military expansion and modernization, we must implement certain policies and laws between the United States and China. The first and most important in this case is that we must avoid containment. Due to China's increase in military assets and changes in military organization, it is imperative that the United States does not make China into our enemy. If the United States were to implement containment, the government of China would see this as a threat to their prosperity, and it would in turn have more reason to use their new military force against the United States. As I have shared, Chinese military expansion does not need to be contained and can instead be put to good use for both the United States and the rest of the world. The second policy suggestion I would like to make is that of developing a plan for crisis mitigation. For this policy, my suggestion would be to continue our work with the U.S.-China project on crisis avoidance and cooperation, the PCAC, in order to maintain our goals of creating a deeper mutual understanding of security threats that could pose a problem for the Chinese and the United States and the relationship between our two nations. The PCAC also seeks to allow the exchange of views on how to handle certain policy situations. Our developing crisis mitigation is a great start to avoiding any unnecessary conflict and to improve our political relationship. My third policy would be for China to continue increasing its transparency of their military. The United States has always been skeptical of the transparency of China's military. Transparency is a result of trust, and according to China, the lack of transparency is a form of protection against a much stronger rival. It is understandable that no country can be completely transparent with all of their military strategies, but there should be an agreement on facts shared. Some suggestions would be allowing both sides to know numbers, overall goals, and their potential. Transparency builds trust between nations, and trust is an aspect that will be necessary to for the success of the relationship between China and the United States. In conclusion, if we put aside our fears, it is easy to see that China has a lot at stake as well. China's prosperity is a very persuasive factor, keeping China from doing anything too drastic militarily. As their power continues to grow, they have more to lose. Thus, they have the same aspirations as the United States, to relieve world tensions in order to protect the existing world order to benefit themselves, which in turn benefits the United States. Thank you, and I'd like to introduce Brittany Chung, our regional expert. Thank you, Caroline. Hello, my name is Brittany Chung, and I'm the regional relations expert of China A, and I will be discussing peaceful integration of both the U.S. and China in the Asian region. First and foremost, we must recognize the fact that America and China's mutual pursuit of Amer economic prosperity in the Asian region directly translates into the shared desire for regional stability. Neither party should not and will not dramatically alter the current state of affairs and jeopardize the current state of peaceful open trade. Simply said, the benefits that can be unlocked in the region trump the cost that will come with regional tension. The U.S. and China therefore must work together diplomatically and to peacefully um, integrate one another into the regional fabric. Through integration, the U.S. and China should advance their common interest, a move that will empower both nations and help the U.S. retain its authority in the region. There are a lot of issues that both the U.S. and China can collaborate on, such as nuclear nonproliferation in North Korea. Due to its geographical proximity to the country, China shares U.S. aspirations to curb nuclear buildup in the region. Exerting their influence as the two largest economies in the world, both countries have a greater chance of achieving nuclear nonproliferation in the region by working together. In addition, both countries are interested in establishing peace in the Middle East. Through growing trade and investments, China has increased its presence in the Middle East, a region of high, obvious high interest um, to the United States. The most prominent development might be China's growing relationship with Israel an ally of the United States. With Israel as a common ally in the region, the U.S. and China will not only have similar interests, but the capabilities to implement uh, mutually beneficial regional policies. Um, the Iran nuclear deal, which was reached last week, foreshadows the future successes that can take place through positive U.S.-China relations. The ultimate hope of future Sino-American relations would be the mitigation of regional disputes, such as the one in Taiwan and the South China Sea. Such successes are actually possible, especially through the use of multilateral institutions. The key to peaceful integration of both the U.S. and China onto the Asian order is the utilization and the strengthening of multilateral institutions. Um, strong use of multilateralism decreases incentives for aggressive actions for both parties and allows for the preservation of the current balance of power in the region. 
ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, perhaps best exemplifies the importance of multilateral institutions in fostering positive Sino-American relations. As of 2011, U.S. trade with ASEAN reached a value of 255 billion U.S. dollars, while China's trade with the institution reached a value of 400 billion U.S. dollars in 2012. Clearly, both the U.S. and China have benefited enormously from their peaceful involvement in the regional institutions. The investments both countries hold in ASEAN alone is an argument in and of itself for, po for positive relations between the two nations. Both countries should continue to work with ASEAN to maximize their economic benefits, which um, actually um, the U.S. imports from ASEAN actually predicts for 2020. Um, and a gradual increase in its imports with ASEAN um, should continue to maximize their economic benefits and even solve some differences, such as the South China Sea dispute. Uh, multilateral institutions are essential to positive U.S. and China relations because they have served and will continue to serve as obstacles against the escalations of tensions in the region. In fact, in the past two decades, we have witnessed the ability of multilateral institutions to deter regional tensions m multiple times. For example, in 20, um, 2002, 21 days after its own entry, China also accepted Taiwan as a full-fledged member of the WTO. In addition, China proved its allegiance to economic institutions over its hostilities with Taiwan when it joined APEC, an international trade agreement that included Taiwan. All these actions prove that multilateral institutions can lead to peaceful integration in the region and therefore should be the centerpiece of American policies in the region. Multilateral institutions are not only obstacles for tensions, but platforms for, on which uh, future negotiations can take place. Unfortunately, the Taiwan-China conflict continues to be a thorn in Sino-American relations today. But actually, a historical overview of the China-Taiwan relationship displays an overall trend of progress, especially in the past few years with Taiwan's newly elected president, Ma Yingzhu. President Ma and his Chinese counterpart have ushered in an era of improved relations with increase in trade, joint maritime exercises, and travel. Such ex uh, such ex events dispel claims about China's obstinacy on its relationship with Taiwan. China is clearly showing signs of flexibility on its um, relationship with Taiwan. The U.S. should take advantage of this. With its presence in Guam as leverage, the U.S. should lead the initiative for peace. Through multilateral institutions such as the U.N. and ASEAN, the U.S. can reduce its forces in Guam and slowly decrease the quantity and quality of its arms sales to Taiwan. In response, China can be asked to collaborate on joint military exchanges with Taiwan and remove short-range ballistic missiles of close proximity in the East China Sea. These give-and-take steps will hopefully lead to an eventual halt of U.S. sale of arms to Taiwan and the Chinese removal of the use of force as a possible tactic in its dealings with Taiwan. The U.S. should seek a unified region in which the U.S. can foster economic growth and increase its authority as a global power, along with har harmonious relations between China and Taiwan, one founded on economic interdependence and compromise. The, the South China Sea can be eased through a delicate balance of international and regional institutions. An international framework that can alleviate the tensions in the South China Sea is the United Nations Conventions of the Law of the Sea. Its regional complement is the 2002 ASEAN Code of Conduct. The UNCLOS establishes standards actually capable of solving existing disputes. And the 2002 ASEAN Code of Conduct reinforces international pressures for China um, to comply to the con uh, convention by reaffirming ASEAN members' commitment to the UN and the UNCLOS. With colossal economic and political investments in both the UN and ASEAN, China will, have to, uh, will virtually have no choice but to accept the demands from the pow powerful multilateral institutions. The U.S. should work together with both institutions and ratify the convention itself, along with reduced U.S. surveillance missions in the northern part of the sea to express support and trust to China. Furthermore, through ASEAN, the U.S. and China can collaborate on other issues, such as establishing an anti-piracy patrol in the Malacca Strait. All in all, Peaceful integration in the Asian region is a beneficial policy for both countries. Attempts to escalate disputes would be irrational, lacking a legitimate cause and incentives. The U.S. should collaborate with China and build on mutual interests to achieve regional peace, such as nuclear nonproliferation. In addition, U.S. policies toward China should have a strong emphasis on multilateral institutions, especially in respect to conflicts over Taiwan and the South China Sea. Such policies will permit the U.S. to expand its scope of authority and influence in the region, upholding its power in the global arena. Thank you, and now I will hand it back to Mikhail. Thank you, Brittany. 
Now that you've heard from our economic, military, and regional experts, I will recap our position and the policy points that we believe the U.S. should adopt moving forward. China A again takes a position that the rapid economic and military growth of China is a change that should not be perceived as a threat, but rather welcomed as an opportunity for future collaborations between both countries. Here are the key takeaway points we hope you leave with. China's integration into the global economy is essential. A key policy point would be that the U.S. should join Asian institutions such as the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. The U.S. must work with China to minimize strategic competition. The U.S. should both create crisis mitigation techniques and a mutual agreement to aid in keeping peace with China. Engagement will not threaten America's traditional partners in the region. Lastly, the U.S. should continue and in even increase its involvement in the region, working with the U China towards achieving peace in the area. As we stated in the beginning of this presentation, the ultimate goal of American foreign strategy and any good strategy in general is maintaining a stable global order. If the U.S. adopts the policies we have presented, it will once again prove its ability to mitigate misunderstandings that can lead to preventable disputes while bringing an emerging great power under its umbrella. We would like to thank you again for joining us and open the floor for questions. Okay, two questions. Um, I'll start with Molly and then move on to Caroline. Um, Molly, plausible story. Um, but I wanna, I wanna go farther and see you talk about how there was the hardware and the software and that could totally work. Um, what if there's institutional hijack or substitution? So what if you're right but only temporarily? Can you maybe talk about historical precedents for what you're talking about and what would happen if your plan did not work out according to plan? Okay, well, um, firstly, I think a lot of the suspicion of China beginning its own international institutions was basically because, um, or a lot of the suspicion was rooted in the idea that they wanted to circumvent these US institutions and start pursuing Beijing's political agenda. However, as I mentioned in the presentation, they're such broad-based organizations and they include, or the AIB includes nations that have interests very counter to Chinese interests. Um, Another reason, however, why if, some, if China tried to exert a, an exclusive or unilateral agenda in any way, um, it would be impossible for them to do so, is, main, is also because something I didn't mention in the presentation is that most of trade in China, or China is increasingly reliant on the Asian economy as a whole. Um, its trade in China has been shifting more and more recently from normal trade to processing trade, which means that um, China imports parts from other Asian countries and then assembles them before re-export. So there's very little added value on Chinese soil, and China is increasingly um, less capable of establishing a vertical monopoly over production and increasingly dependent on the global economy. So China really could not in any way um, have an extensive upper hand to be able to do so in those types of institutions or to hijack an institution like the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank to give itself a preference in a major way. Okay, strong answer. Um, Caroline, a lot of your logic seemed to be based on economic reasoning. You said China wouldn't risk relations with the United States and still it's taken provocative steps of late. So part of this is sort of why is it provoc provocative to the uh, extent it is. But the real question I want to get at is uh, what if China cares more about domestic stability than it does about economic higher rates of economic growth and the way to ensure uh, uh, domestic stability would be to foment outside enemies? I would say that, what if they do? Um, well then, I mean, they'd have to understand that the reaction of the United States would, obviously, like we have our allies, we take it, we will, we're on the side of Taiwan, we're on the side of Japan, and if they were to take actions um, that are risky, like you talked about, and spread to, say, the islands that they're trying into the South China Sea and um, take Taiwan back, um, they would have to understand that the United States would act. And the reason I don't think they would is um, I read um, one of John Eikenberry's arguments about how um, they're just too reliant on the current world and they wouldn't risk that. And just because, I mean, as she said, yes, their economy is still growing, but it is slowing down. Um, they already don't want to take too many risks as far as that. And I, I don't think they should at least logically my thinking, I don't think they should 
try and militarily waste their military budget on something like that. I mean, she's <laughs> original. Yeah. Oh, um, just like the idea of domestic stability um, being interconnected with military, military um, Chinese military actions um, in the region, um, I think the idea of our whole argument is that domestic stability and economic interdependence has a stronger tie. Uh, China, Chinese domestic stability has a greater um, economic interdependence and China, Chinese economic um, actions in the world has a greater um, influence on domestic lives, like the everyday lives of the Chinese people. So I feel like um, an average Chinese um, citizen um, would um, promote economic interdependence, free trade, that is giving, um, a, increasing his standards of life rather than Chinese military occupations in the South China Sea. But is the average Chinese perspective critical here? Critical of? Uh, the policy, the course of policy. I would say so, especially um, increasing um, um, domestic um, instability in the region. Um, it's becoming a greater um, it's increasing over the past year, and I think it does have a significant influence. In oh, just to follow up on that, Brittany, you advocated the United States should retreat and pull back forces from Guam, but mm -hmm. if problems should escalate, then the United States would be in a weaker position to respond to that, which doesn't gel with Caroline's comments that if, in fact, it escalates, mm -hmm. then the United States would, of course, uphold um, regional order by force. Um, what I was proposing is the gradual reduction of Guam forces and the quantity and quality of arms sales to Taiwan. So kind of holding, taking little steps um, and then asking China for a smaller step as if um, such as the reduction of, their reduction of um, short range missiles in the East China Sea. So going step by step by step in order um, to reduce possibilities of uh, big uprising of big military conflict. Okay, but as China gets stronger, it's closer to those areas, and if we de-escalate or pull back as they get stronger, mm -hmm. you still are in the same situation that incentives might change as the balance of the local balance of forces change. Mm -hmm. But our idea is a base, uh, an idea based on compromise, so we wouldn't de-escalate as long as China does not de-escalate. But what we're proposing is that due to such heavy economic interdependence and um, China's um, dependence on multilateral institutions in the area, China will have a greater incentive to comply with U not U.S. demands, but multilateral demands um, that will reduce conflict in the area. It's in the better interest. Okay. Thank you. Professor Price, would you like to ask a question? Yeah, sure. Uh, I thought it was an excellent presentation. Uh, a couple questions. First one, um, I agree with you guys that China does want peace and stability. Um, the question I have is based on the idea that I'm not sure that China's vision of peace and stability is exactly the same as the United States and its allies in the region. Um, you, you said kind of at the outset that China doesn't necessarily want to create a new order, but let's just talk briefly about two of the examples you guys brought up. The AIAB, um, you said one of the reasons that China created it was that the uh, other bank was not updating governance. Isn't that kind of a euphemism for they weren't giving China enough clout within that bank, and so therefore they created another one that they have more clout in? Um, and to the extent that that's not the case, what about talking about UNCLOS and the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea? We say, okay, well, China is trying to integrate into this order. They're trying to respect the order, and yet their claims for you know what they see as their um, you know their internet and their national waters go far beyond what they're given in terms of the 200 mile limit under the United Nations. So I understand you kind of have this vision of well, if we talk through multilateral institutions, maybe our two visions of how the order should look in the region will reconcile. But at least as of now, it seems like those two visions are actually quite different. And so saying you know the U.S. should integrate into the Asian order, um, it's unclear to me which vision is the one or if ultimately you're just pushing for some type of reconciled vision. So a little more sense on that would be helpful. Mm -hmm. um, just briefly to touch on, um, again, an institution like the AIIB um, and how it is increasingly looking as if China is trying to exert control and formulate an entirely new Asian order. Um, the reason China decided to make, or like, for instance, it tried to streamline the process by which um, higher up decision making in the new bank was made. So in the World Bank, there was a resident board that had to meet a few times a year and approve all decision making at the cost of $7 million a year. That's $70 million that could have gone to funding infrastructure growth and the World Bank and Asian Development Bank just have, do not have the resources to fund all of the like, economic potential that is in Asia to fund all of the projects that are currently asking for funds. 
So the, um, the new Chinese bank, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, decided to streamline the process of higher up decision making and creating a non-resident board that will meet by video conference. And out of the 12 members of like the board of directors, only six of them will be Chinese and six of them will be other international members. So it's not as if there's complete control there. Also, Quick I think, follow up on that. So yeah. six out of 12 is actually quite a significant amount. And if you compared that to the other bank, I have no doubt China wouldn't have 50%. Is that not the case? Um, no, China does not in the others. OK. But OK, keep, the points are well taken. Sorry to interrupt. Um, and then in, just in terms of, um, I, I'll pass this off to the regional, um, regional and military experts in a minute. But I think even though China is, um, it may seem as if um, it's rising in some ways in terms of power. Um, it's definitely not an expansionist power. Um, like the claims that it's been trying to make, at least to China, are very historically rooted. And China is, like, by and large, a rational actor whose primary motives are economic. As Deng Xiaoping, like, Deng Xiaoping said in, like, in during the reform and opening, it doesn't matter if the cat is black or white, or, or as long as it catches mice. Essentially, saying like we don't have this nationalist ideology. What motivates us as a country, even if like we're going to move away from a very socialist form of governance and instead pursue more state-owned capitalism, what matters is that we ensure um, economic success and prosperity for our people. So in that, China will not seek for overreach and expansion um, because it's at critical risk of that currently. So um, it's not an expansionist power, and it's regional. It's, we're not saying it doesn't have ambitions, but its ambitions are very strictly limited. OK. Uh, so quick, So my other question, and just quickly to you, I would say I, I, that was a great answer. Um, I would say we're not necessarily saying the, the, the uh, different things, because in one way, what you're saying to me is China is defending the status quo, but because of historical reasons or otherwise, they have a different vision for what the status quo is, right? They're returning to what they see as the natural status quo with China as a prominent power in the region or whatnot, which slightly changes maybe the way things have been. But nonetheless, I, I thought it was a good response. Uh, my other question is for Michaela, I think, although I'd love for anyone to weigh in. Um, one of the challenges challenges with any type of general restraint policy is how do you sell that to American people based on American identity as being, you know, a leader in the world and we face things head on and we don't back down and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, in some sense, what you're talking about is a version of restraint. So I'm interested to know how you would go about not just selling this to, you know, some academics in the room who maybe to varying degrees are more amenable to a restraint policy, but to the broader American public. I mean, I would kind of push back. I don't think American public sentiment today is of centers around this idea that we are the best and we have to go and quell any threat that may be in any place that is near or far. I think people, after going through two wars within the last, um, I guess, a decade or so, are more restrained. They don't want to risk lives. They don't want to risk taxes, tax dollars. They would much rather we focus our interests um, and our policies on domestic renovation. I think that's why the Obama administration has been um, so favored or favored, compa more favored comparatively than the Bush administrations because we're more, we're more focused on our education, um, you know, improving or demolishing, I don't know, our prison institutions, stuff like that. There's not this incentive to go, you know, find terrorist groups. Granted, we don't want them to come attack us, but when, I think it was Mark Rubio, was he the one that said, like, you know, if I'm president, I'm going to go find, like, send out troops against ISIS. There was a lot of public backlash because we don't want to engage in another conflict. So I think there's, um, there's definitely, I think from an American foreign policy perspective, or for like a, the government perspective, there definitely may be that tendency to feel that we must go and take preventative um, and maybe preemptive measures. But from a populist perspective, I think it's much more restrained. Thank you. Let's actually move on to one more question. Uh, Professor Goddard? Yeah. Um, I'll just ask one because I, I, because of the time. Um, so my question actually is, is mostly directed towards Brittany. It has to do with allies. Right? At the beginning of the presentation, we had this idea that we weren't just going to focus on Sino American mm -hmm. relations. And yet, where is Japan in this story? Where are the Philippines in this story? Right? Where is Korea in this story? When we're talking about bringing in China into these institutions and negotiating, ostensibly China is coming in because they're going to be getting something that they want, mm -hmm. that they're going to be getting in some ways some uh, changes that they want, particularly in the islands. And yet these are changes that Japan and the Philippines have made very clear that they do not want to happen. And they are some of our most valuable allies in the region. So how exactly does this integration happen and still maintain the type of robust relations that we've built up in this region? over the last 50 years? 
Well, our policy focuses, especially in, our, in the regional um, aspect, really has a strong emphasis on multilateral institutions, which our allies are already a part of, and that U.S. has um, played a very influential role in. So um, going through multilateral institution ensures um, that we're not neglecting our allies and their desires, especially in, the, in respect to the United Nations Conventions of the Law of the Sea, um, is actually beneficial for our allies, because it does um, um, ameliorate tensions in the area, which is detrimental. Um, as in addition to China and America, all of our allies share the same interest, which is regional stability for economic growth. Um, especially um, South Korea and Japan were aligned with China through the ASEAN Plus Three um, initiative. Um, so looking towards that, um, definitely our use of n our use of multilateral institutions instead of bilateral agreement ensures the fact that our allies won't be neglected. Just one brief, aren't we all concerned that a pullback is actually going to tell somebody like Japan, you're going to have to go ahead and rearm yourself? Because they've made it clear that they aren't just concerned about economic growth, that they are concerned about their sovereign claims in the region. I think that our, our alliances are still, are still strong. Like, our, our commitment to Japan does not, um, in specific, in Japan does not uh, wane due to our collaboration with China. It actually strengthens it because we are working in Japan's favor and their desire for regional stability. Thank you. Thank you, China A.